Lazarus, come forth. Joseph Benner, February 1932. When Jesus was sent word by Mary and Martha that their brother, Lazarus, whom Jesus loved, was sick, he said to his disciples, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Then he stayed two days in the place where he was with his disciples before going to see Lazarus. In the meantime, Lazarus died, and as Jerusalem was 15 furlongs away, when they reached there, he had been in his grave four days. Evidently, Jesus knew this, for he said to his disciples, Our friend sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. The disciples thought that he meant it was just ordinary sleep. From Jesus' first statement, it is apparent that he purposely let Lazarus die, for he wanted by means of this experience to teach his disciples, as well as Mary and Martha, and all who afterwards learned of it, a great lesson. And we will try to point out that lesson to you. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary stayed in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wouldst ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother will rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come unto the world. In every one of us are the Mary and Martha qualities. The Mary quality that sits at home and mourns and condemns when someone or something dear has been taken away from us, and the Martha quality that goes to seek the Lord, knowing that by prayer and asking God everything will be made right again. There is also that in every one of us which hears such prayers, and if we listen carefully, it will say, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth thou this? The higher self, the comforter, the Christ within, ever says this to his disciples, to those who love him and turn to him in their sorrow and need. For is he not their life, their health, their strength, everything that they are? He is their real self, the real spirit animating their bodies, their minds, and their souls. They are nothing without him, are in a way dead, or as Jesus said of Lazarus, are sleeping, and he alone can awaken them. You, who think you have found the Christ, hear these, his words, and believe. For he is the resurrection and the life. And if you live in him and believe in him, you will never die. We will prove this to you later. When Jesus came to Lazarus' grave, which was a cave, and a stone lay upon it, he said, Take ye away the stone. But Martha said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God? After they had taken away the stone, Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I know that thou hearest me always. 
but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. The foregoing quotations from the 11th chapter of St. John. Everyone is weighted down with the stone of belief that he has to die. And before anything can be done for him, that stone must be taken away. But even the Martha quality in us hesitates to believe that death can be conquered. That life is so old that it stinks in the consciousness, poisoning even our faith and trust in God. But the Christ, our real self, who knows, ever repeats, if thou believest that I alone am, and that this body of flesh is only the garment I put on and off at will, thou shalt see the glory of God. With the lie about having to die removed from our consciousness, a stone that has weighted us to the earth for ages, our purified and uplifted minds can say in the freedom of the new vision that is then ours, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I know that thou hearest me always, for thou knowest the inmost desires of my heart, even inspiring in me such desires. But before I was dumb, for I did not understand, but now I know that whatever thou inspirest me to do, that can I do, for it is thy purpose to do it through me. And likewise did Jesus offer a prayer to his Father in heaven, his higher self, thanking him for that which was to be done through his agency, this being chiefly to impress those who stood by that they might learn that God was working through him. For think you that Jesus did not know that Lazarus was not dead, but that he re was really sleeping? Think you that through his uplifted consciousness, he could not see the soul of Lazarus just as he was at the moment in the real world of the soul? Could not see Lazarus sleeping there after his transition, as is the case with most souls after four days, giving them time to regain their strength after the depletion of the, their vital forces caused by sickness? Remember, all this sickness and death was only a belief of the old mortal consciousness, and sleep was the means whereby it would be freed from the effects of such devitalizing belief. Of course, Jesus knew all this and could see Lazarus just as he was in the inner realm of being, invisible to all eyes but his. Because of the deep sleep into which Lazarus' soul had fallen, Jesus, in order to awaken him, called to him with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. But Jesus did something more than call to him. He also knew where Lazarus's spirit was. Even as when our physical bodies sleep, our souls retire within to our homes in the soul realm, so when our souls sleep, do our spirits retire within to their homes in the spiritual realms. Jesus had first to recall Lazarus's spirit back into his soul body and thus awaken his soul. And then he had to recall his spirit and soul back into his physical body. However, Jesus knew he could not do the latter without the father's aid, but with his assistance, which he knew would be given him, he could do anything. For had not the Father inspired him to do all that he was doing? He confidently called to Lazarus to come forth, knowing that the Father deep within Lazarus's spirit would hear and empower Lazarus to transcend the law of matter or of mortal mind, rise out of his soul sleep 
once more enter the idea of his body consciousness and thus revivify his old fleshly garment. This actually resulted in response to Jesus's call. Lazarus rose up out of the grave in which his body had been lying, came forth with all his grave clothes still around him and his face wrapped with a napkin. These wrappings symbolized the old beliefs that still enfolded him in his mortal consciousness. So the Christ of us must command all our faculties to loose him and let him go. To loose the mind of these lies and let it be free to know the truth that there is no real death. The soul can never die, for it houses the spirit. It can sleep. It can withdraw from the brain mind. But as the soul is our consciousness, it will always exist, whether in a physical body or out of it. The lesson Jesus sought to teach was that the flesh and even the brain mind were of no importance and had no power. Only as the I am, the Christ, endued them with power and gave them their life, Jesus let Lazarus die in order that he could teach the world to the glory of God, that the Christ spirit, the real man, a son of God, is superior to all limitations of the flesh and of the mind responsible for it, and even to death itself, and that when anyone knows his sonship, his Christ nature, he can command his soul, and through the grace of God, his soul or his consciousness will come forth from its sleep re-enter the body and rise out of the grave of its old mortal beliefs and be free hereafter to live its true soul life. You will note that in these words we have given you the personal application and have shown what you can do in the raising and freeing of your own soul as well as that of another. When you are in your true consciousness as a son of God, as was Jesus, and which we have taught you how to enter. This proves that in that consciousness, you are the resurrection and the life, that you are always the risen life from which soul and body consciousness derive all their sustenance, and that when you can get your mind to come up of its own free will and live in your consciousness, it can never die, nor can its outer expression, the body, for even it then has no sense of separation, but is also partaking of and abiding in your consciousness, which being God's consciousness is the only consciousness. But this also shows how you can in that same consciousness see, even as Jesus saw, that one recently deceased, no longer than four days, can be similarly awakened and recalled to physical life, providing that your mind has the same absolute trust in God, the same sense of oneness with him as had Jesus, and which is the natural consciousness of every Christed soul. Read the above over many times and ponder it well. There is so much of vital moment in it, all that we urge every disciple to stay with it day after day until all its wonderful meaning becomes clear and a living part of your consciousness. When this is accomplished, we promise that some remarkable things will happen to you. The Time of Tribulation In the foregoing article and the one on the crucifixion, we have pointed you to some very great truths, and we have explained their operation sufficiently so that all who are ready to make the sacrifice of self can use these truths to free themselves from the darkness, confusion, and suffering now manifesting everywhere in the world and which before they are removed 
will grow many times worse. Where have we been leading you? To the kingdom? Why? Not just to free you from the results of your own sins and those of the world, but that you may know the truth and receive your divine heritage as a son of God, and then will turn about and use your human instruments to help us and all our brothers in Christ to lead as many others as possible out of the darkness into the light. You in your human self are nothing, but as a soul awakening into the consciousness of your true being, and thus becoming another channel through which the light can be poured for the freeing of the world, are of very great importance, are the most valuable help you can be to God and to his army of light. The time is growing very short. The great battle is on in the inner realms. Can you not see the strenuous and unceasing warfare for the souls of men that is now being waged everywhere? Everyone is being tested and tempted as never before in the history of the world. Every possible pressure is being brought to bear upon men's minds day and night by the forces of darkness. Everything that can tempt and lure them away from the teachings of their parents, from the following of their higher instincts, and from their love of goodness and purity. Need we point you to the agencies being used, to the newspapers giving their front pages and scareheads to murderers, notorious gangsters and criminals and their activities, to the jazz types of music, to the cubist and futurist trends in art and architecture, to the widespread drinking and bootlegging and all their accompanying evils, to the movies and theaters specializing in underworld racketeer and sex plays, to the magazines following in line with scores of new cheap ones being devoted entirely to such subjects. Constantly through these agencies are suggestions being poured into the minds of the people, and unconsciously, almost all are finding themselves being pushed into doing things which, if they stopped and reasoned it out, they would never of themselves think of doing. Do you realize that 90% of the people believe whatever they read in the newspapers and national magazines, and it does not occur to them to think and reason about whether it is all so or not? Or if they did, they would have no cause for believing differently, for they have no other source of information, or sources being wholly controlled and directed by these super forces to give out the information that they want the people to believe and no more. And do you realize that most people are naturally credulous and trusting and wish to believe what they are told? They refuse to consider that they are being deliberately deceived by evil powers that are seeking to further their own sinister ends. Think you there is no actual direction back of all this? That it merely happens that men are just naturally drifting into a state where they are forgetting all about God and losing their faith in an invisible deity, discarding all the teachings of their forefathers? If so, recall the methods now being used in Russia at the present time to mold the minds of the people, especially of the children in their schools, who are taught that God is but a myth, a belief of the unintelligent foisted upon humanity by the capitalist. And the new generation there is actually growing to maturity in a world which to them has no God. Can you not see that no mere group of men is doing this? That there is a powerful and invisible intelligence with a most diabolic and far-reaching purpose back of it all? And which is just as surely working from the inner planes of being, influencing and weakening all minds in which selfishness in any way rules? as is the Christ spirit influencing and strengthening all in which a loving desire to help others is dominant. Be not deceived, you followers of Christ, but keep your eyes wide open. For these are the days prophesied by our beloved leader, Jesus Christ, in the 24th chapter of Matthew. Read carefully the whole chapter, but note particularly these verses. For many shall come in my name, saying, 
I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, who so readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains, for there shall be great tribulation, such as was not from the beginning of the world to this time, no nor ever shall be. And except those days shall be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe him not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. We have printed in the heavy types the statements to which we wish you to pay particular attention. We especially want you to note that we seem to be living in the days about which Jesus was prophesizing. It is true that many times in history, there have been those who claimed those particular times were meant. But we are now facing a period when the whole world is involved in the conditions mentioned, when previously only a few countries or at most one continent were affected. We are now in the midst of wars and rumors of war. These things must come to pass. Can anyone deny it or see how war can be avoided with the mad scramble to increase armaments going on in every nation in their anxiety to be prepared for what they all expect to come? But the end is not yet. These are but the beginnings of sorrows. Therefore, watch that they do not deliver you up to be afflicted. That is, be prepared so that in his name, in his consciousness, you can rise above it all and be free and untouched by whatever comes to pass. Many are beginning to come and pose as Christ's, to speak and prophesy in his name and to show great signs and wonders, so that they are deceiving all but the elect. See that you are not caught by such. Remember, you have always within you a sure guide and authority, who, if you will turn to him, will constantly point out to you the fallacies in their speech and the qualities in their personalities that are not of Christ, and who will surely prevent your being deceived. You can easily see that iniquity is abounding everywhere, especially in high places. And it is not to be wondered at that love and faith in God should wax cold when national authority prevents the word Christ being used in any state document, when the words Christ and Christian are eliminated from every school book in America, and when no president of the United States has dared to take his inaugural oath on the open pages of the New Testament. Think you that the Antichrist is not almost in complete control of the outer world, which means has almost complete control of men's minds? 
of all but those who have been tested and proven in their allegiance to Christ? It is the testing and the proving that is now going on in the battling for men's souls by the forces of evil and of righteousness, each side striving to win and hold those whom they can reach and influence. And it is only those who have definitely chosen Christ and who endure to the end that will be saved. The gospel of the kingdom is now being preached to all the world. It is the witness, pointing the way for all men and calling upon them to repent. For the kingdom of God is truly at hand, is closer than even many of the elect dream. Every people on the earth has been reached and invited to come into his kingdom. So now we are ready for the end. We have told all men the truth. We have uncovered to them the evil. They must now decide whom they will serve. No one can do that for them. And then they must be tested and proven. All can be saved if they will endure in the truth. But evil has cajoled, coerced, and so deceived the minds of men that few will endure Vast numbers of them have succumbed to evil, have been enticed by it over to the side of darkness, and now evil sits on the throne and has become the king of the world. It only remains for it to become established in the holy places, compelling all the nations of the world to repudiate Christ and God as they have done in Russia, and then will the abomination of desolation begin, spoken of by Daniel and Jesus. Then is the time when all disciples of Christ must flee into the mountains of the spirit, must deliberately and actually transcend their body consciousness and enter and abide in their Christ consciousness. Those who are journeying with us have been taught to do this. Every stage of the process has been shown them and has been made so plain that all may know. Only those whose minds have been more engrossed in outer things and would not be convinced of the necessity of doing what we persistently urged have failed to find the kingdom and are now unhappy and discouraged. And unless they deliberately go back and start over again and study and live with the teachings until they prove their truths every step of the way, they will find when the evil days come that they will have no place to flee, for in those days there shall be great tribulations, such as was not from the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. We have spoken of these things in our booklet, Brotherhood, published in 1927, but in the papers only casually. But the time has come when we must need speak plainly and tell all our dear ones of the vital necessity of thoroughly preparing themselves, of now applying assiduously the teachings given to the immediate problems before them until all are fully proven, so that they will be ready for whatever comes. You can now see one of the chief things we have been preparing you for, we have been so insistent in urging you to discipline and master your minds only in order that they learn instantly and perfectly to obey when you command. We want not one of you to be left behind, but that means that those who have not been diligent in their study and efforts begin now as never before to making the finding of the kingdom and the living in their Christ consciousness first in all their thinking, speaking, and acting. For as stated by the master, although the time of tribulation will be shortened, yet will there be but few in the flesh saved. He speaks of the elect, they who cannot be deceived. Would you be one of them? Then you must find him within your hearts and learn to retire within to the soul realm and to abide there with him. He, in those days, will be your only refuge and strength. 
with those who are able thus to retire within to flee into the mountains, it matters not what happens to their garments of flesh, for they will be consciously living in their immortal soul bodies in a higher dimension that will soon manifest upon the earth. Those who will endure to the end are those who have passed the tests in this term of earth schooling called the Piscean Age and have graduated into the Aquarian, the next higher grade. It means that they will have faithfully learned the lessons taught them by their great teacher, have freed their minds from all the error and sins of mortal consciousness, so that they will have risen into his consciousness and thereby will have earned the right to follow and be with him in the higher grade. It also means that their minds, having been cleansed of all the old beliefs of mortality, including the sense of separation and the fear of death, their bodies will no longer be really flesh, but the light of the spirit will shine through them, making their youthful and immortal soul bodies within visible to those who have the eyes to see. In other words, the word, the Christ of them, will actually have become the flesh. So, it makes no difference to them in the terrible times that will later manifest in the outer what becomes of their physical bodies. They will merely withdraw their consciousness from the body and it will no longer be visible. For the visible is not the real body. It exists in the soul realm. But when they so choose, they can again appear in the physical, wherever they wish to be. What really will take place is that on account of the near presence of the great army of light on the inner plane of being, its vibrations of divine love are so powerful that the whole earth and everyone on it will be affected in their inner nature in such a way that everything not attuned to the Christ consciousness will be unable to endure its high vibrations and will consequently disappear from manifestation. The fact is, these new vibrations are going to be those continuously manifesting in the new age, or in the higher grade of earth school into which those who have passed the tests and endured to the end will have graduated. We want you to realize all that this means. First, try to understand that this great army of light is composed of all the souls of heaven and earth who have entered the Christ consciousness. This means that you, if you are a disciple of Christ, in your soul consciousness are of this army. For being conscious of serving him in your heart, which means in your soul consciousness, your soul is definitely enlisted with him and his light is guiding you in all that you do. And many new recruits are joining this army on the inner plane daily due to the increasing efforts of all workers on both the outer and inner planes. Then, try to realize that this great army of souls comprises the actual inhabitants of the kingdom of heaven, and they are bringing with them the light of heaven, which means of their Christ consciousness, right down upon the earth and that their powerful light will drive out all darkness of error and evil from men's minds so that there will be no longer any mortal bodies for all sense of separation of there being a body and a soul will have disappeared there will then be only the soul and its body can you not then see that all who cannot rise into their Christ consciousness while undergoing the tribulations of the testing period will be unable to endure its high vibrations and will naturally give up their fleshly garments in one way or another and retire back into their soul homes on whatever planes they happen to be? Then naturally, the disciples of Christ will possess the earth, bringing heaven their real world where their souls dwell where all is goodness and perfection, down into actual manifestation upon the earth, and which world will then be visible to all those belonging and dwelling on the earth, while all those in the lower grades of the spirit who were formerly their comrades on earth will be invisible. 
but will still be alive and visible to one another, each on their respective soul planes, exactly as it is now on the various inner planes of the soul. But we will explain more about this in the next paper.